Hello Big Geeks, welcome to another What Even Is episode, and this week we're tackling just about the least trendy beer style on Earth. But luckily Bradley's looking pretty cool today. Right. And we're going to do the history of the Hefeweizen. Come on! I think it's a style that both you and me love. But we rarely feature on the channel. People rarely talk about them in the beer world. It's a much maligned beer style, Johnny, isn't it? I mean, these were the original Hazy Boys before Hazy Boy was cool. Yeah, pretty much. When, when New England IPA came, I love that we're doing a story about <laughs> Vice Beer and we're already talking about New England IPA. But when that first came out and people were like, you know, it's lazy brewing, beers shouldn't be hazy. You're like, yeah. this has hundreds of years of history of being hazy and we've got some supposed purists being mm. like beer shouldn't be hazy yes it should and we're going to be telling you the history of this beer we're going to be telling you the wonderful stories behind these incredible breweries and indeed why the vice beer the hefeweizen and whatever you want to call it should be cool should be much loved it's a super delicious beer yeah. you don't just have to drink it when you're on holiday in germany uh -uh. everybody should be drinking this stuff we should i mean we've done a homebrew on it already but people should love vice <laughs> <laughs> So we've established, Johnny, we both love Hefeweizen. Maybe a bit more than I thought I did. You really love Hefeweizen. <laughs> I'm a bit worried. Uh, if I was, you know, uh, in a relationship with you, I'd start to question, maybe you love Hefeweizen more than I. Do you think it's because it's an underdog and you can see the worth, you can see the kind of history there and you want it to be celebrated more than it is? Well, there, yeah, there's a couple of reasons why I love it. One is I think it's absolutely delicious. I mean, it tastes of vanilla, clove, banana. These are all delicious flavors. Great stuff. Also, it's super geographic, right? Whenever I drink it, I'm transported to Bayern, to Munich, to a beer garden, to pork and pretzels, more than any other beer style that I can think of. But also, it, in doing the research for this video, I fell more and more in love with Hefeweizen because it's, it's a very significant style mm. and it's got an absolutely incredible story behind its origins, which we're going to dig into. The story of Hefeweizen starts almost with the start of humanity, Bradley. Wow. What? In fact, I'm just going to pour the full thing in because I think we're going to need it. <laughs> and you should always drink the bottom of the heifer. There's a really? little clue okay. for you. Interesting. So basically, beer before we got really good at brewing, um, was made with all kinds of different ingredients. It might have barley, it might have had spelt, it might have had rye, it might have had sorghum, it might have had rice, anything you could get sugar out of to then ferment and create yeah, yeah. grains, basically. And obviously wheat was a super important one in that. So wheat beers have been being made for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, wow. like eight, 10, 12,000 years, wheat has been used in beer. So you've got this rich history of using wheat in beer. How does that become a Hefeweizen? So the story kind of starts in about the 1400s. So these beers were being made, these wheat beers, um, all over the world and in this region as well. And what happened was so much wheat was being used in the beers in, in Bayern mm. that the, the, the ruling leaders, the Dukes, the Wittelsbachs family, Okay. who ruled uh, Bavaria, they said, we need to get some rules in because actually there's not enough wheat for bread baking. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually quite an important thing in humanity back then. We so ate a lot of bread. They made so much beer they didn't have enough for bread. Basically, there was a great shortage of wheat in the late 1400s. These boys back then, <laughs> they were big, big on the beach. God right? love the carb. Wow. Um, so they introduced this rule where they said, right, you can only make beer from barley, hops and water now. They didn't right. know about yeast back then, so yeast wasn't included in the definition. Just, just a magic like, stick. Exactly. They said, just stop using wheat. We need The bakers need the wheat, right? We need to eat before we drink. Mm. Uh, which is very much my philosophy, not, not so much Brad's. Yeah. But they did, because the Wittelsbachs loved these wheat beers, they allowed one family, one brewery, one family brewery to keep making vice beer, yeah. wheat beer. Amazing. And this family was a rich family and they paid the Wittelsbachs a lot of money for that kind of license. Right. But so that rule that banned everybody else was called the Reinheitsgebot, <sighs> which we all know about. It's the pure about this. So this family that was still making wheat beers, the Dragensbergs, Right. They were paying a huge amount of money to the Wittelsbachs for that license, and they were making a huge, huge amount of money. To the point where Duke Wittelsbach was a little bit like, he started saying, like, oh, wheat beers suck, because I think the Dragensberg were starting to threaten. They were showing up in, in classy carriages and things. Exactly, yeah, exactly that. Yeah. So um, anyway, they got a bit of stroke of luck, the Wittelsbachs, because actually Mr. Dragensberg, Duke Dragensberg, he died without an heir in 1602, somewhere around there. So all of their brewing empire was transferred to the ruling family. So suddenly... <laughs> they nicked it. Yeah, basically, maybe there was a murder, don't know. They suddenly owned all of this vice beer empire. 
Nice. Exactly. Uh, and they basically then started brewing it all over the place, making loads and loads of money. Apparently, at one point, it accounted for a third of the, of the income for the Bavarian state, just vice beer. <laughs> This is how popular it was in Germany for a while. Yeah, yeah. But sadly, you know, popularity of Weissbier started to wane um, to the point where there, there were only two breweries again making it. Wow. So it completely fell out of favour, at which point the Wittelsbach sold the, uh, the, 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 what was left of that brewing empire to a name you might know, Schneiderweiss. Ah. So this family then took it over, stuck with it, and became the world's, for a while, the world's biggest vice beer producers, did very well, and they make incredible beer. We haven't got any to taste today, but they make incredible and very varied beers. And the reason we're not talking about today is because we're gonna deep dive into all the different forms of vice beer eventually. So they basically made it popular again, and by about the 1950s, it started getting popular again. In Germany? In Germany, but not so much the, the, the rest of the world, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. So they were kind of the saviors of this delicious style, that, which results in what we've got here. So we're drinking the Andex, and there's a reason I've picked this one and why I've poured it first. It's because this is about as traditional like again. So they still use decoction, which was you know a big part of that sort of, almost like the cradle of lager brewing, Czech Republic and, and Southern Germany, all doing decoction lagers um, and decoction vice beers, which predate it. But what it resulted in is some grain being boiled. You get that flavor from it. You get caramel, toast, brioche, yes. these kind of flavors, which are super evident in this. So that's one way in which this beer stands out. And it's still a major part of the vice beer flavor, like kind of a sweet caramel kind of thing. The other thing that's vital is a specific yeast. So this yeast would have been naturally occurring in Bavaria, and it has some pretty unique flavors, right? Mm. Banana, clove, meringue, uh, bubble gum you can get in some of them, like really unique flavors that you don't get in any other strains of yeast, really. And that's partly the yeast strain, but partly what they did with these yeast strains. So brewing has always been taking what nature gives you and having to run with it, but trying to make improvements. So they'd be doing these step mashes, these decoctions, certain fermentation temperatures, all of this to get the best out of the yeast that they have. Do you think um, these guys, when they uh, first got bananas into that part of Germany, they went, oh, it tastes like wheat beer. You know, Brad, this is why you're on this channel, because I'd never thought of that. They didn't have bananas. They'd have been like, when they first got a banana, they must have been like, this smells like beer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this smells like that's wheat beer. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's amazing how banana is. It's almost like those sort of like powdery, kid sweet uh, well i mean that, that's right? the exact flavoring they put yeah. into isoamyl acetate that's mm. the name of the flavoring the chemical that they put into those foam banana sweets mm. and that's what you get out of this yeast it's amazing it's taken me back because i drank this a lot when i was younger and i still love those sweets as mm -hmm. well who doesn't like fake banana flavor they're great but it's all what's really interesting as well is that the texture of those sweets kind of powdery bubbly is kind of like this so yeah. the other thing with hefeweizens is they are super carbonated right and that lifts it because because it's got all these sticky esters fennels flavors clove yeah. banana could be really overpowering if you then put loads of carbonation in you lighten it you make it more drinkable we've we've recently learned from adam at the brewers association the effervescence in beer triggers oh my memories God. in your brain. Which is why this is so nostalgic for me. That's right? why it takes me, me back to Bavaria and Bananas. you to 18-year-old in a spoon, I'd imagine. 18-year-old in a spoon, yeah. <laughs> Belgo, Belgo. Oh, Belgo as well, more classy establishment, yeah. yeah. So, oh my God. Right, it's the effervescent bubbles as well. Man, there it's all go. working together. That's why it's so yeah. uniquely nostalgic for you, man. Yeah. So, I mean, this is why I love this style, right? Because as soon as you start digging in, you're like, oh, and there's this, 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 and there's this. Yeah. So let's talk about what technically a Hefeweizen is, right? So Hefeweizen literally means yeast, yeast, wheat. So you've got this very specific Bavarian yeast. You've got at least, it's supposed to be at least 50% wheat, but actually a lot of breweries will go 60, 70%. You've then got high carbonation, and you've hopefully got these notes of banana, clove, mm. bubble gum. I get real kind of meringue, banoffee. The cream, banoffee pie with lots of cream is yeah. what I get from this beer. It's sort of, it, yeah, it has loads of sort of dessert-esque qualities to it, but it's not too cloring and too sweet Yeah, for it me. sounds like it should be cool. Yeah. But that high carbonation, low bitterness just makes it incredibly crushable and makes it amazing with certain foods. Pale food, beige food, the Bavarian palate, is so good with so rotisserie chicken 
well roasted pork, pork potatoes, mm. uh, pretzels, oh. great with mustard, sweet mustard. Stop it, Johnny, you're making me know, really God, hungry. Why didn't we get these things to have on the table <laughs> with us? Um, and so I picked this one, like I said, because they used decoction still, yeah. um, also because this is still a monastery, right? So back in those times, most breweries would have been monasteries. They wouldn't have been secular, they'd have been ways of raising money um, for the monasteries, uh, the way of life, and also feeding the monks. This is still a monastery? This is still a legit monastery. Wow. So it's, it's not Trappist, it's not the right yeah, order of, right. of religion, and it's not brewed to anything like the Trappist sort of definitions of, you know, given to charity or this kind of stuff. That's quite mind-blowing to think that there are other monks in the world other than Trappist. I know, brewing. right? Yeah, there are lots of monks still involved in brewing, they're just not called, called Trappist. Do you think it's because being a monk's quite dull, so they need to sort of spice up their life with just some, some lovely alcohol? I mean, that's almost certainly it, yeah. I mean, back then you'd, you'd have to be chased, you'd have been celibate, oh. what you're supposed to be celibate, yeah. you'd have been stuck pretty much in the monastery, you'd need booze. Praying all day. You stuck at home. We know from lockdown, you know, oh, you, you drank more. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so that that is why I've used Andex. Yeah. We're now going to move on to another Hefeweizen. So this is the best-selling Hefeweizen in Germany, and therefore, because nobody else likes Hefeweizen, the best-selling Hefeweizen Worldwide. in the world. Worldwide. It's like the World Series in America. It's like, well, nobody else plays. <laughs> yeah, baby. But, <laughs> So Paulana, you know, the, the, the thing that Germans are absolutely amazing at is yeah. making huge volumes of incredibly high quality beer. So I'm expecting this still to be absolutely world class. Seems a bit Despite the amber, fact that, a bit more darker to me. Yeah, so this is the other thing that confuses me, right? So in the research I was looking and they, they used to, like Weisse yeah. is white in German, right? So Weizen, uh, wheat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weisse, white. That's not white. That's is not it? a white bit. No. And I don't even think it's pale in compared to like a, a Pilsner or something either. Well, so I've got a couple of theories on this. Hopefully, there's some beer historians out there that might correct me. So it would have been a matter of relativity, mm. right? So when we talk about uh, IPAs, pale ales in the 18th century, in the UK, uh, 19th century in the UK, they were called pale ales, but they were pale compared to porter, not actually pale. Right. So I'm thinking that maybe these were just lighter, maybe because wheat, when you malt it, doesn't get as dark. Uh, sorry, when you kiln it, doesn't get as dark. Maybe these were paler than the box, which were the main lagers being brewed back yes. then. Yes. So it was seen as just lighter, whiter than the box. That's what made. it is, surely. Hopefully, because, yeah, that's, that's amber. We just need to build a time machine now, Johnny, then we and, can confirm. Bill and Ted meets Craft Beer Channel. Oh, beautiful. That's a slightly more savoury smell. Yeah. Less banana, more clove. Not getting a lot of banana. But I mean, the, the volume of this stuff being made is something like, I, th I think I want to say three million hectolitres. Are these, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's, a, that's Before I just gloss over Bigger it. than the biggest brewery in the UK, biggest like, uh, independent brewery in the UK by 10 or 15 times. So we're, we're like we're like ragging on it a bit, saying it's the, the most uncool beer style in the world. Yeah. There's a lot of people in Germany drinking that love this it. stuff. Yeah, but it, it's still southern Germany. You know? right, Northern yeah, Germany yeah, yeah. drinks some of it, but they're a bit like, meh, they drink their Berlin, uh, Berlin Pilsners and stuff. And I've always felt like it's a meal in the glass, this, for me. And I think a lot of people would agree with you. It's, you know, so, it's, it's like a it real rich quite heavy. kind of heaviness to it. This one <clears throat> is significantly lighter than the first one. It is, isn't significantly it? Significantly yeah. crisper, much more kind of malt and caramel and much less of that ester. I'm not getting a lot of the esters, no. Yeah, it's, it's a much crisper kind of, kind of flavour, which might be why it's so popular, you know. Lots of people are lager drinkers. This is nowhere near a lager, but it's much closer, it's much more drinkable. Um, and I think that that probably appeals to more people. Shall we try a beer? From the oldest brewery in the world. Yeah, well, yes, and double yes, of course. <laughs> right, so this is Weierstefana. Yeah, man. That's the brewery. They're the oldest brewery in the world. In fact, on the site at which they're situated, uh, uh, maybe the seventh century, there's been brewing going on since then. But this actual traceable brewery, 1040? 1040. That, wow. Yeah, so... To put that into context, that is before the Battle of Hastings. Yep. Which is like 1066. Pre pretty old. It's not pretty like old. 1066, Thousands, it was. Over a thousand years old. No, just under. Just under a thousand years old. Uh, it, it, not a mathematician. <laughs> if you and I are yeah. lucky enough, we will live to see the thousandth centenary. Twenty. Thousandth centenary. Twenty-six. Millennium. Millennium. 
yeah. of, of this in, wow. in 2040. 2040, hang on. Oh yeah, I'm talking about 2066. I'm yeah, no, with, well, we might live for that, I'm but it's for pretty unlikely. Is that you're going to die arrow to the eye like Harold. Yeah, yeah. On, on, on the right date, just <laughs> done. Exactly. Uh, right. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, man. Man, this is history in a glass. History in a glass, but also available in Sainsbury's. What a world. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is between the two, right? <sighs> it's got more S3 stuff going Banana on. Banana and caramel. The Banoffee's back. Yeah, the Banoffee's back. I'm not getting loads, loads of clove, I don't know. No, think. it's a less complex aroma. <sighs> It's a great bit. It tastes a bit smaller than, than this one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is, whether that's just perceived because it's not quite as like verbose in all the angles that are going off. I think all of these are around 5.5. .5. I mean, I've got to be honest, this is by far the most delicious by quite a way. Big time. Um, it's absolutely stunning. Um, but in terms of like, if you want to find the best beer in a supermarket, you're not going to far, go far wrong with that. And I mean, Via Stefana have a huge historical. This is where I was talking about the historical impact of, of yeah. Hefeweizen. So these guys would have made part of their name on Hefeweizen's once they were allowed to brew it, right? And now they are a brew school. Wow. They are home of, of like lots of research into brewing. You know, they've become, you, you can study there. Meantime, the guy that founded Meantime studied at Weiss Stefano, you know. These guys have such an important role to play in the development of lager and of vice beer and of all the styles that could possibly come off of, sorry, not lager, Hellas. Um, so vice beer brewing has built a dynasty of, of other styles by being so significant in Germany for about 200 years. So, I mean, we both love, love this beer style. I'm get, honestly, I'm going, I got this at my local bottle shop, the beer shop. That's so good. I'm going to go back and get more. <laughs> ne next time I'm in, I'm going to pick up some. It's so good. So good, man. How should we be drinking this beer? Yeah, well, I mean, a Hefeweizen glass makes a big difference. It really okay. helps with this. They're like the real tall glass. glass. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Just Google like Paulana Bayern Munich yeah. and you'll see the photos of these, these beautiful right. glasses. Um, pouring it into that having a big foamy head, making sure you swirl the bottle and then tip it back in. Like, I don't so know if you, you can see. you said you've got to put the sediment in. Yeah, the set you want. So a lot of these bottles are bottle conditions. This would have been bottle conditioned. Yeah. I don't know whether these two will have been. There'll be yeast and wheat proteins that yes. will settle at the bottom. You want to get that in your glass. So this, it's kind of like orangina where you've got to wake the flavor. Well, yeah, yeah, shake it to wake it. Mate. You do that with a vice beer, but you wouldn't do that with, say, an English ale. You Loads don't want, bit. You don't want to do that with most beers. Yeah. With this one, you do it with that. Yeah. How warm, how cool should we be drinking this? I find them, like, deeply refreshing. Yeah. I think they're great to drink in the summer. I mean, don't get me wrong, you could definitely drink it yeah. at four or six, like you yeah. would an IPA or a lager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, particularly with something with that amount of depth, I'd want that to be a tiny, teeny bit warmer. And how fresh should we be drinking it? Can we age this? No, freshness really matters with with these ones. So yes. we've got the video coming, which is all the different varieties. They're the stuff you can age, they're the stuff you don't have to drink fresh. But with these pale ones, you really want to drink them as fresh as possible. You know, Munich, as a big beer brewing town, was also a massive beer drinking town. Right, yeah. And they drank a lot of their beer fresh. So, so it's sort of similar to the sort of Czech tradition where you you, you maybe take a little bit more time brewing it, but then you've got to drink it as fast as you can. Yeah, exactly. Because it yeah. tastes bang fresh is yeah. when you want it. So other than summer where they couldn't do that, that was very much the yeah. idea. Um, and, and that's what it should be. So it's not like an IPA where beyond three months you're starting to be like, ah. Yeah. But it is, you know, if you see something with a month left, it's probably not worth picking up. Walk it's not away. Going to taste the same. Walk yeah. away. Walk away. Walk away. Unless it's this one. Never walk away from this one. Um, so yeah, drink, drink fresh. Drink pretty cold. Make sure the sediment's in there. Serve with something beige, and just 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 revel revel in the vice. Welcome to the Craft Vice Beer Channel. Uh, it's been a pleasure covering other styles, but fuck 'em. Uh, vice beer for the win. Hey, Prost. Prost.